Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. The 1985 movie, The Color Purple, is a stone-cold classic. Steven Spielberg directed, Quincy Jones did the music, Oprah Winfrey made her acting debut. All three of them are involved in this new version of the movie coming out, the musical. Now, The Color Purple had already been turned into a pretty successful musical on Broadway, so it'll be interesting to see if it works on screen. But I wanted to play you this interview from 1982 that NPR's Faith Fancher did with Alice Walker right after she published The Color Purple. Because listening back, it's kind of incredible that either adaptation worked, you know, both artistically and commercially, considering how heavy the themes are in the book, you know? We're, we're dealing with rape, incest, real harsh stuff. But Walker says something poignant, which is that the only people she thinks would have a hard time with the material are people who are, quote, uptight and bigoted and afraid in their own lives. Support for NPR comes from FX, presenting A Murder at the End of the World, starring Emma Corrin, Clive Owen, and Britt Marling. Emma plays Darby Hart, a sleuth and tech-savvy hacker. She joins an exclusive group invited to a retreat. When one of the guests is found dead, Darby must prove it was murder before the killer takes another life. FX is a murder at the end of the world, streaming November 14th only on Hulu. Reviewers say of author Alice Walker that she is exceptionally brave. She takes on subjects that would scare off most writers. Her latest novel, The Color Purple, explores the survival of black women in a harsh world of rape, incest, and domination in the Deep South. But Walker says that The Color Purple is more. It's a story about heroic lives and love as well. I asked her how the main characters in the book, Celie, Nettie, and Suge, developed. I was living in Brooklyn, and I, I kept thinking that I wanted to write a story based on some things that, you know, had been interesting to me, some things that had happened, you know, in Georgia, mm -hmm. um, some things that were happening to me. And I wanted very much to get in touch with, with sort of the spirits of these people. I mean, I knew they existed, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't come in New York. They just they really didn't like New York, and so I had to move. So I moved out here. And they liked San Francisco a little better, except they didn't like earthquakes. <laughs> so I had to take them up to a little town called Boonville mm -hmm. in Northern California. And it looked so much like Georgia that they loved it. I and see. so they started coming, and we started having a wonderful time. Did they talk to you? Oh, yes. Well, you know, they characters do. I mean, they, they talk to me. They talk to each other. Mm -hmm. They grow mm -hmm. uh, bit by bit. But I was mainly, you know, doing a lot of swimming and a lot of uh, just hiking in the, in the woods and a lot of lying about in meadows and dreaming and gardening and, you know, and they, they developed. The entire book is written in letters. Celie, the main character, starts to write to God the day that uh, a man she thinks is her father rapes her. She finds out later it's her stepfather, but through most of the book, she thinks the man is her father. And she starts writing to God. And the whole book is a series of letters, either Celie or her sister Nettie, um, after Nettie runs away, writing to her. Why did you pick that particular structure? Well, it had a lot to do with understanding the character of Celie and understanding that someone in Celie's position her position is very similar, for instance, to slave women who, who would, if something like this happened to them, uh, would have to write or pray to God. Mm -hmm. They would have no one else to rely on, no one else to tell. And Celia is very much in this tradition. The women in your book are people that you cry over, you identify with, you want to love, you want to care about. The men in your book are for the most part, despicable. <laughs> Were you writing for a particular audience with this? Are you don't care if men read this at all? Is this a woman's book you're writing? Well, I think that the book really accurately reflects what is happening in the world today and what has always happened in the world today. In fact, women are dominated by men. I think that many men will read it and rejoice. I think that, that there, are, there are men who really are not you know, blind to what mm -hmm. what is being done to children and who will see in the character of Albert someone who becomes transformed. I think only very, you know, rather easily threatened people will be turned off 
by the men in this book. I think that Samuel, for instance, is a wonderful man. I don't see that he's despicable. That's the preacher. I don't see that Adam is despicable. Mm -hmm. The one who is really despicable is the man who raped Seely, and Albert is despicable until he changes. Mm -hmm. But this is life. People do become and are despicable, and they are capable of change. But what I meant was the the women, none of the women in your book, even though they do go through changes, are uh, uh, evil like a lot of the men are. I mean, the women seem to be more um, characters that you understand why it is they are the way that they are. The men, I didn't understand why they were the way they were. They just seem to be background noise more so for the women to interact with each other and with them rather than any one of them standing out and you can say, oh, here's a character and I can understand why he's going through the changes he's going through. Well, you know, I think in any book you choose your main characters and the main characters in this novel are Celie, Shug, and Nettie. And it is about the bonding of women and these are women for whom men are not central. I say of myself and I say of them that men are not the center of my universe. I am the center of my universe. So I think if you look at it from that perspective, you can understand the structure of, of the book and the characters of the people. So the book is about some strong women and the bonding they go through, but it's not necessarily written only for a woman audience. Oh, definitely not, you know, any more than Tolstoy would write just for Russians. <laughs> Are you worried at all that the strong themes in your book, um, rape, domination, um, even lesbianism, uh, will be a big turnoff for a large audience? Not at all. You know, I think that one of the reasons I wanted to have strong, beautiful, wonderful women loving each other is because I think that people can deal with that. I have no fear whatsoever. I think that the people who are uptight and bigoted and afraid in their own lives will have difficulty. But black people, for instance, you know, the majority of them, I really don't think are small-minded and bigoted. I think that they can easily understand anybody loving anybody. Mm -hmm. And this book is an excellent opportunity for them to, to try it if they don't already. You say at the end of the book, I thank everybody in this book for coming, A.W. author and medium. Did you feel like this was a spiritual experience? Oh, definitely, yes. Uh -huh. And I felt very chosen by the people in the book. And I truly thank them for coming. I, I enjoyed them so much. Uh, the whole time I was writing, I was, I was, I felt as if I was in the most delightful company imaginable. Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple. Ever thought about dangerous microbes in space? Monsi Roman has. She helped design the International Space Station as the lead microbiologist. That meant making sure bacteria wouldn't eat the life support system. Hear her story and the innovative work of other Latinx scientists on Shortwave, wherever you get your podcasts throughout Latinx Heritage Month. Support for NPR and the following message come from Front Door. Home to-do lists can seem endless. Repair the leaky dishwasher, fix the fridge, get the faucet to stop dripping. If only there was a way to get it all done. Now there is. Introducing Front Door, the one-stop home repair and maintenance app that lets you chat with home repair experts, diagnose the problem faster, and cross off that to-do list. When something in your home needs fixing or maintenance, open the front door. Download and get a free video chat. This message comes from NPR sponsor Viking, committed to exploring the world in comfort. Journey through the heart of Europe on a Viking longship with thoughtful service, destination-focused dining, and cultural enrichment on board and on shore. With a variety of voyages and sailing dates to choose from, now is the time to explore Europe's waterways. Learn more at viking.com. 